I think we're ready, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to our final formation session. Can you believe it? The final meeting that we have before our retreat. And thanks for braving the winter wonderland. We may be ready for spring, but I don't think creation's ready yet. Next month, we will be gathering for a retreat day on the first Saturday of April, and we'll welcome those from Chicago Heights who will join us for that retreat day. I'll be speaking about the handouts that you picked up when you first came in at the end of the meeting, which includes just a bit of homework for you and for your uh, sponsor also. As we pray today, Sister Margaret will be leading us in prayer. Let's keep our several sisters in our prayers today. <coughs> Sister Agnes Ann, who is usually with the Chicago Heights Associates, had surgery for her hip on Thursday and is doing well, but we pray for her healing. And we thank Denise Egan, who is taking over for Sister today. Sister Megan Farley, one of our sisters in Aurora, who had a complicated pancreatic surgery a few months ago, died early this morning unexpectedly. And Sister Teresa Marin, who is the sponsor to Judy, and to Pam, and she's also Judy's cousin, was admitted to the hospital early this morning. So let's pray for all of them. Are there any intentions from our associates that you want to bring to prayer today? Our speaker today is Sister Margaret Schreiber, and Margaret has been a vowed Dominican for 50 years. In fact, she celebrates her golden jubilee this summer, through, starting in January she started, and through these years Sister has served the church and community as an elementary education teacher, a DRE, a pastoral associate, and a college professor. Margaret was at Catholic University in Washington DC as a student, and when she finished her degree she became a professor there. Presently she is ministering at Marion University in Indianapolis as a director of graduate studies in theology. We welcome Sister Margaret, who will be speaking to us on living the liturgy. Thank you. And a special welcome to Marion, my alma mater. <laughs> Let us pause for a moment to be aware of God's presence within and among us. As we gather to reflect on the meaning of the liturgy and ways we can live it more deliberately, we acknowledge that Lent is at the door of our heart ready to knock. Often and traditionally, we have thought of Lent as a time to give up something that we really like. What often happens is that we spend the season of Lent craving what we have sacrificed. And then, on Easter Sunday, we return to what we gave up, with only the change being that we no longer crave what we gave up. Life remains unchanged. However, Lent is really about conversion. It is a time to look at life and reflect on how we live and to search for ways to live it better. It's a time to open our hearts to receive the grace to change, to change unhealthy habits, to change negative attitudes, to open our minds and hearts to the needs of others, and to reach out to persons that we may try to avoid. What Lent calls for is personal change. That change is ongoing. And on Easter Sunday, we celebrate the change that has begun with our commitment at the beginning of Lent, but we continue to change and move closer to Christ because of what we have done during Lent. So Lent is not so much about giving up for the sake of giving up. Rather, it's about beginning anew with the grace of conversion being offered to us. So now, is the time for us to open our hearts to that grace Lent holds out, ready to be poured out into our hearts. 
Let us pray. <clears throat> Gracious God, as we gather this afternoon, we are aware of your presence and the many wonders we have experienced of your abundant love. Open our hearts and minds to engage in the mystery of liturgy that transforms us and calls us to conversion. Lead us, inspire us to grow in our awareness of how we live and how we can live better. Guide us as we prepare for Lent and grace us to open ourselves to new possibilities that come with living the liturgy. We ask our prayer as always through Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay, living the liturgy. What what does what does liturgy? What what do, what do you think of when you hear liturgy? And what do you think it means when we ask the question or you know, what does it mean to live liturgy? So just take a minute to get focused at your table and what what does that say to you? What is liturgy and what what does it mean to live liturgy? We're going to be talking about it all afternoon, so share a little bit of wisdom as we move forward. What what are you thinking? What are you talking about? What are you saying to each other? It's public, it's not private. Good. Could have prepared for this ahead of time, they would have known. What actually does the word liturgy mean? Good question. Good question. We're going to get there. Oh, okay. <laughs> Marion, if you want to wave or say anything, let me know, okay? All right, good. All right, so what is liturgy and what does it mean to live the liturgy? What have you experienced in liturgy? We're not going to talk about this just yet, but what have you experienced? What has been your experience? And what are some words that define liturgy? Pat said it, it's public. That's important. It's a public worship. So what makes liturgy a liturgy? Liturgy, this is from our Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, Sacrosanctum Concilium, and this is from the Constitution on the Church, Lumen Gentium, and they both say the same thing. The liturgy is the summit toward which Christian life moves, is directed. At the same time, liturgy is the font, the source of all power, the font from which all her power flows. Taking part in the Eucharistic sacrifice, which is the font and apex of the whole Christian life, they, meaning those who participate, offer the divine victim to God and offer themselves along with it. So our constitutions, both of sacred liturgy and of constitution on the church, which flowed from the Second Vatican Council in the 1960s tell us that liturgy is central to Christian life. It is the source and it is the summit of our life. All week we move to the liturgy and all the next week we take what we received at liturgy and live our life and then we return. So it is the source, it's the apex, it's the font of Christian life. So it's a celebration. What does liturgy mean? It's a celebration of the Paschal mystery. It's a celebration of Christ's life, death, resurrection. And that's identified as the Paschal mystery. All liturgy is the Paschal mystery. So it is ecclesial. What does that mean? It means it belongs to the church. So before this all started, I was asked if I was going to connect liturgy to, to Dominican life. Well, this is how it's going to be connected. Liturgy is ecclesial. Dominican life is ecclesial. It is uh, life within the church with a special charism to contribute to the church. So liturgy is ecclesial. 
It's communal. And here's how it's different from other kinds of communal prayer. We can, liturgy is communal in the sense that we are a community formed here, preparing for associates in this Dominican congregation. We could, for example, pray the rosary in here. It's a devotional prayer. We could pray it communally, but it would not be liturgy. It would be communal prayer that's confined in a sense to this group gathered. How's that different from going to Mass? Well, the community that is formed at Mass is way beyond the boundaries of the people present. It goes to the universal church. It goes globally as a community. So we are all connected ecclesially and communally when we are in liturgy. So when we pray the Liturgy of the Hours, or anyone who prays the Liturgy of the Hours in the privacy of one's bedroom, it is still ecclesial communal prayer because we are connected with all who are praying the Liturgy of the Hours. That's how we're connected with the Eucharist. The community connects us uh, globally. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, all liturgy, the intention is an encounter. An encounter with Christ and an encounter with the ecclesial community. And then it is public worship. It is the Christian public worship liturgy is. And so all of our sacraments are liturgies. But I'm going to confine liturgy to the Mass today. But every sacrament is liturgy, it has a liturgical rite, which does all of this. It's a remembrance of the Paschal mystery. It is ecclesial because it is approved by, given to us by, it is worshiped by, with, and in the church. And then it's communal in the sense of reaching beyond those gathered to be inclusive of the whole church. And it intends an encounter with Christ and it is public worship. So we live Sunday all week. That's what we're called to do. We're called to live it. It's a living tradition. In the earliest days of the church, after the resurrection, the disciples gathered on Sunday. On Saturday, they went to the synagogue. On Sunday, they gathered together as a Christian community in order to remember Christ's resurrection to remember what happened. That was the turning point in the life of a Christian, that Jesus actually rose from the dead. So on Sunday, the community gathers to remember Christ, the Paschal mystery, to remember Christ living among them, still, not just way back then, now. We also refer to Sunday as the eighth day the day to experience the mystery of God in Kairos. So it's not constrained to one day, the seventh day when God rested. Rather, we call it the eighth day. Takes us beyond time. Takes us into uh, the, the hope and the promise of eternity. It's not confined to chronos, to chronological time. Rather, it is God's time. And what that looks like, or who that is, is it's part of the mystery by that we live. Did you have a question? I've never heard that before. Somebody said Christian eighth day. Mm -hmm. Eighth day, right. Because the idea is, or the meaning of that is, it takes us beyond chronological time and moves us into what we would call Kairos, God's time. So Sunday, think about a liturgy that has had an impact on your life and what made that liturgy impactful to you. What happened in that liturgy? Why, why do you remember it? I think sometimes we get in the car after Mass and before we're home, we 
mess was, is a distant past to us. It didn't stick with us, but once in a while it does. Think about what, why, why does that happen? What might be the reason that liturgy kind of stuck with you? So in order to know how to live the liturgy, we have to understand the liturgy. So this is a cursory, a kind of a just quick overview of Mass, but what I want to do is I want to connect you to some things that are happening at Mass that connect with our life and, and how when this is happening at Mass, we can take note and be attentive to it. So we have a Liturgy of the Word, and then we have a Liturgy of the Eucharist, and then all these uh, smaller rites that happen within it. There it is again in more detail. So we're going to look at each of these very quickly, but be, they will help us connect to what's going on in liturgy and what we can take from that liturgy in our living. So the entrance. When we gather for liturgy, typically we are coming from all over the place, especially if you live far from where the church is. But we're leaving home as individuals, and we're coming into a common space. We are gathering in this common space. So, the get, so we begin Mass, we want to gather. We want to become one. And then, as we begin the liturgy, we have a procession in. We have the liturgical ministers and the presider come in. And as they walk through the assembly, we need to have a sense that they are picking us up along the way and bringing us into this liturgical experience. That this is part of our gathering. We're being gathered and brought together. So, after we are gathered and the presider is up front, we sign ourselves. We sign ourselves with the sign of the cross. We sign our bodies. Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. The cross is a, the, a, a central symbol in our liturgy. It's part of the Paschal Mystery. It's how Jesus died. And so the body of Jesus crucified touches our body by our making the sign of the cross. And this basically summarizes what's going on. I'll say it again, but how does Mass end? With the sign of the cross. So this is, this is gathering us. It's part of our gathering, it's going to be part of our sending the cross. And it's, it is also a reminder of our baptism, because when we are baptized, we are, sign, we are signed with the sign of the cross. When we come into Mass, many people will touch the holy water and make the sign of the cross. So it's, it's also connecting us as baptized persons when we make the sign of the cross. Okay, liturgical language, it always gets us in trouble um, because it's challenging. But the greeting that we have is a liturgical language greeting. It's not when you're coming in and you're greeting one another, hey, how are you, how's your week, good to see you, how are you? When we start liturgy, that's not what it's about. It's about greeting the spirit dwelling in each of us as we begin. So the presider says, the Lord be with you. And we respond, and with your spirit. It is calling to that deep within us spirit. It's calling us to go inside to, to experience the spirit that we share because of our baptism. So it's calling that spirit to spirit greeting rather than beginning as we would begin as we enter the church. So the exchange uniquely belongs to the Christian community and it's particular 
to this moment in the community's life when it begins to celebrate the source and summit of life. Now that may sound strange to you, but wait till you hear what Dominicans used to do and then you'll think it's even stranger. But the point is, it's language that's familiar to a particular community and it has deeper meaning sometimes than, what, than the words that are used. So the sisters that are here, let's see if you remember. I tested that out and some of our sisters remembered. When we walked into the community room, what did we say? God's, right, and the community would say, God save you kindly. Now, if I walked into my family room with my parents and said, God save all here, I think they'd look for a straitjacket, but they don't understand that language. And that's what happens when we go to liturgy. We learn a language that has meaning for this particular experience. Okay, penitential rite. Right at the very beginning of the liturgy, we acknowledge our sinfulness. And the point is not to get down on yourself. Oh, I'm such a sinful person and I'm so unworthy. Rather, it is to recognize the mercy of God. That's what it's really all about. And it stands in contrast to what we are about to celebrate, the mystery that we are about to celebrate. So we call to mind our sins and we Lean on, expect, hope for that promised mercy of God as we begin the celebration. And we do this a couple of times. We'll, we'll see it again later on, how that connects. But it is, it is the unconditional mercy of God that is here. It's not about our sinfulness. We're all sinners in one way or another. But we all need to turn and look for and reach out for the mercy of God. So we start our liturgy doing that. Okay, then we sing the song of the angels. The glory to God. And this, this prayer, of course, is incarnational. It's about when Jesus was born. It's about the angels singing. But it's also about heaven and earth being joined. that God sent Jesus to bring heaven and earth together. And the liturgy does this multiple times, how heaven and earth are one as we ritualize this Paschal mystery. So they're gathered and, and together. We're not just gathered with one another in the church at large, we're gathered with the angels and saints. Think of the mosaic at the mother house upstairs. The, the mosaic where, where, where are these saints landing? Where are they landing? The table, right, the altar. They're right there at the Eucharistic celebration. So our glory to God reminds us that we are all connected. Sometimes when the, when the new translation came out, um, it was obvious to me that we praise you, we bless you, we glorify you, we give you thanks, we, and, and it's blah, 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 blah. And I read a commentary on that, it was powerful. It said, we don't have language to say it in one phrase. We just have to keep digging for meaning, for ways to give thanks and give praise and glory to God. And so our glory does that for us. It, it, it repeats a lot of things that mean the same thing, but the effort is to try to offer that. Okay, this is, this is, this is always powerful for me in liturgy, when we think about the opening prayer. The, the name of the opening prayer is colic. If you put the accent in a different place, you're going to get collect. So the opening prayer is our colic, and it is about collecting. When the priest, it, it's a signal to us when the priest says, let us pray. There's a shift going on. So we have begun the liturgy gathering. 
aware of our sinfulness, giving praise to God with all the saints and angels. And now we hear, let us pray, shift. And the shift is to collect the strands of what has taken place at the Mass. So all that we've, we've done, our acknowledgement of our sinfulness, our awareness of God's mercy, and also, as we prepare to go to Mass, we probably, many times, I know this morning, I brought with me my prayers for Megan's family, just profoundly, because her death was so unexpected. But I brought with me, I brought the things that make going to Mass especially purposeful for me today. Who's sick in my family? Who am I concerned about? What am I concerned about? And I bring that with me into the liturgy. And again, as they process in, what are we doing? We're gathering all the people, but we're also gathering all of our prayers and concerns and our needs. They're being sent forth. And then the colic places all of it into one succinctly um, prepared prayer by the presider. That prayer is our time to start or remember or as we prepare for Mass, to know what we want to go up in that colic, what we want collected as we enter into the church and as we begin the liturgy. This is our time for our personal prayer as a community. So, as we get ready to listen to the word, we've been gathered into a church. Our personal concerns and prayers have been gathered, and we are in communion with God in one another, or we're on that path to get there as we're moving through the liturgy. So we are prepared now to listen to the word. So we've made these steps to get prepared to listen to God's word. Okay, so those are the introductory rites that get us ready for the first major part of the Mass, which is the Liturgy of the Word. So, Liturgy of the Word. All right, two major symbols that happen. This is the major symbol of our Liturgy of the Word, which is the Book of Gospels. And these are the major symbols that we have for the Liturgy of the Eucharist. This contains the Word of God that will be proclaimed in this Liturgy. This is, this is the word of God's revelation to us, God's presence with us in the word of God, in scripture. And so we carry in the book of Gospels. At the presentation of gifts, we will carry these vessels because these vessels contain the central uh, created realities that we bring for consecration. So these are the two major symbols that we have. I'm going to look at the word, the liturgy of the word first. So the liturgy of the word, the liturgy has two <laughs> rhythmic movements. And the first rhythmic movement is for the liturgy of the word. We begin with our first reading, the responsorial psalm, our second reading, our alleluia, and our gospel. The gospel book brought in is the climax. What the gospel that's contained in there is the climax of the liturgy of the word. That's where we're headed on this journey through mass. After the gospel, we begin our descent into the liturgy of the Eucharist. So we have a response to our readings. We have a homily, a creed, and a universal prayer. And then as we'll see, we start moving back up in the liturgy of the Eucharist to come back down. So that there's a rhythmic movement in the liturgy. So first reading. First reading's from uh, the Old Testament usually, but does anybody know what we read during Easter? 
Acts of the Apostles, right? So in Lent, we, we read a lot from Isaiah, the prophets and everything. But when we get to Easter, we, for seven weeks, we do not use the Old Testament in our liturgies because Jesus is risen and the church is being formed after that. And so we use the Acts of the Apostles for our first reading. Our second reading then is from one of the letters. But just a, a point of detail, um, we have uh, four volumes of the lectionary. Lectionary has the readings for mass. It's not a Bible, but the biblical readings are organized in a lectionary. And we don't carry up the lectionary. We only carry up the book of Gospels. And that's because the Gospel is the climax of the liturgy. So we read our first, our first reading and our second reading and the responsorial psalm. We read those from our lectionary rather than from the book of Gospels. Okay. In thinking about the Old Testament, it's important to understand that the Old Testament did not begin with creation story. The Old Testament really began with the Exodus. The freedom, the movement from slavery to freedom, the movement of God intervening in human history to bring the Israelites out of Egypt into a land of freedom. And that thread is woven throughout the Old Testament about God's interaction in human history. And after the Exodus, that powerful experience of God in their life, they looked back. And that's when the stories of creation and Genesis of the patriarchs got put together. It comes through their experience of God in the Exodus. So why is an Exodus first? Well, when they put the Bible together, they basically did it in a way that seemed more chron chron chronological. But the experience of the Exodus is first. And that experience of freedom from bondage threads the Old Testament. Okay. More language, word of the Lord. So after the reading we hear, word of the Lord, and we say thanks be to God. That word of the Lord should touch us in a way that we understand it as a declaration. Word of the Lord. It should also, or in most cases, put us in a state of amazement. God is speaking to us. God is intervening in human history. And then there's a sense of absurdity. God speaking to us in the midst of this assembly is kind of absurd. But it is what we believe. And our only response, again, thank God we don't babble through the home mass like we do in the Gloria, but our response is, thanks be to God. So the church gives us some language that helps us to have a communal response to things because it's hard to give our response spontaneously because then we would lose our sense of community. And then we have the responsorial psalm. So God is speaking to us in the readings and then we speak to God. Psalms our problems in many people's world or life. Psalms are problems. But I heard somebody talking and I've done some reading on it and I think <clears throat> one way to look at psalmody is that this is embodied prayer. The psalms that we use are embodied prayer. They're prayed by the human person who has human experiences. And sometimes um, they, they refer to the events of history. But sometimes the language is pretty rough. It's pretty violent. And it's hard to say those words. But scripture scholars and psalm uh, 
scholars, tell us to be careful about it. Tell us to be careful about not sanitizing our prayer when things are pretty uh, violent. There's violence in scripture because pain has silenced people in pain. There's no voice for it. And that we, in our own pain of saying some of those words, give voice to that pain. So we, we have songs that we use. Now, some, a lot of some of the songs are shout for joy and you know, um, all kinds of happy thoughts. But we have to understand all of the Psalms are about raw human emotions, whether that's joy or pain or suffering or a response to violence in one's life, a sense of revenge. Those are, those are raw human emotions that we have the opportunity, maybe even a privilege to give voice to that for those who have no voice to speak it. Okay, second reading from the New Testament. Now, the Old Testament is put together and viewed from the Exodus. The New Testament is put together and viewed from the resurrection. So, as people were living with Jesus in time, they didn't have a clue who he was. They couldn't figure him out. But the resurrection changed everything. It's the resurrection that, that even the death, you know, he died. Their experience of people dying is they die. We never see them again, physically. But Jesus flipped everything. And Jesus rose from the dead. And it is from that experience of the disciples that the New Testament takes on meaning. It's from that perspective that the New Testament was written to explain their experience of Jesus that, that made, that, their experience of Jesus that made sense to them, but it only took on this new life after Jesus' resurrection. He wasn't just anybody. He was God. And the resurrection is the is how they received that message. Jesus came back to life. And so the New Testament then gets written from that perspective, that Jesus is alive, that Jesus is with us, that Jesus rose from the dead, that Jesus is God. Jesus is the Christ, the Logos, the Word that was present with the Father and the Spirit in creation. So, the first believers, the followers of Jesus, began to write things down in order to pass on their faith, pass on their stories about Jesus. Okay, now the Alleluia. This is, this is it, folks. This is the Alleluia. We got to make this big because the climax is coming. This is, we're heading to the gospel. This is why we're here in the Liturgy of the Word. We're headed toward the Gospel. We get on our feet. We've been sitting, listening, kind of absorbing this Word of God, attentively taking it in. And now we're on our feet. We're on our feet singing Alleluia because it is the climate. It's a shout of praise. And we sing it because in proclaiming the Gospel, the risen Christ, we are aware of the risen Christ in our assembly. The risen Christ is there, has been. But when we get on our feet and when we start shouting our alleluias, it is to, to acknowledge deeply that Christ is with us, that Christ is within our assembly. And so we get on our feet and we stand for the gospel. It's a different posture. It's a posture of praise. When we listen to the readings, it's a posture of sitting and soaking it in and taking it in. But we stand for the gospel in order to get on our feet and express praise, not only in our words and song, in our bodies. 
So it's all about the resurrection, as I said. It's about the resurrection. We see the New Testament from the perspective of the resurrection as we see the Old Testament from the perspective of the Exodus. Okay, I'm saying this about the fourth time, but I, I, you know, a good teacher has to make the point three times. All right, so what happens after the readings? We're starting our downward rhythmic movement. And because the gospel, particularly the gospel, but all of our readings are so powerful and so meaningful, it is, the pres it is named. The readings are named a presence of Christ in the Mass. Uh, our document on the sacred liturgy says Christ is present three ways at Mass in the presider, in the assembly, in the word, in the elements, the bread and wine, and in the assembly, the, the assembly, the people gathered. So the liturgy of the word is a celebration of Christ's presence to us in the word proclaimed. When it's proclaimed, Christ is unleashed in our midst. It's so powerful that we have to do three things in order to come down from it and to move into the liturgy of the Eucharist. So we have a homily, and we can argue about what homily should be or how they should be written or whatever, but ultimately the effort should be, needs to be, connecting us with what the words of Scripture tell us and how we can take that with us and live it during the week. Often, when you hear a homilist, it will be, well, as we, begin, as we begin to celebrate the Eucharist, let us remember. It's kind of a recap of what was said. It, it should be a kernel of, okay, this is, this is what these readings sent me to do and how to live my life during the week. We have our creed. Baptism, remember, we sign ourselves at the beginning because of our baptism, reminds us that we are one through our baptism. We've all been signed with the sign of the cross at our baptism. And also at our baptism, we have the creed prayed as we were baptized. Do you believe in God? Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? Do you believe, do you believe in Christ? Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? And that's what our creed is. And so together we stand and we, we proclaim what we believe again in this assembly where we are all now connected and we have a shared Trinitarian faith. And then we have the universal prayer. Okay, so um, I already said some of this, but it is that, uh, that God's word would find a home in our heart and the homily should inform us of how to live. And then the creed, it's a summary of our Trinitarian faith. And the universal prayer. So I want to mention this. People will call it a universal prayer, they'll call it gender and no sessions, and they'll call it petitions. All well, basically means the same thing. But I want to highlight universal prayer because I think universal prayer is what's really intended to happen at the liturgy. And that's because this is not a time for our personal prayer. Because that was taken care of with the colic. Does that make sense? So this, the universal prayer, or our general intercessions, positions, but focusing on it originally being called universal prayer, it's addressed to the assembly. So as we, so everything so far, I think I can say everything so far in the liturgy has been addressed to the assembly. This prayer, too, is addressed to the assembly. It's not addressed to God. It's addressed, let us pray for. And what we pray for is our local needs, our national needs, our universal needs. The people in the Christian community around the world who are sick and suffering, those who have died. That's what, now some of those might end up being personal prayer, especially uh, for people who have died in our within a community. But the point is that 
as a universal church, as a people gathered ecclesially, as an ecclesial community, our concerns need to go beyond our personal needs and incorporate universal needs that relate to Christian life or life in general. And then this prayer becomes the hinge between the liturgy of the Word and the liturgy of the Eucharist. So we come from the Gospel, we hear the homily that hopefully is giving us some inspiration to how to live, and we have our creed, our, 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 our um, common profession of Trinitarian faith, and then we move into the needs of the world. Okay, so uh, it's two o'clock, take a break. Okay, um, so during your break, you don't have to talk about this, but, but if you will, um, you know, how can you live the liturgy of the word during the week? What do we need from the liturgy of the word to live it better? So talking, when we come back together, we'll, we'll pull some ideas together or we'll share some ideas, but take a break. So as you're, you're um, sharing a little snack here, and feel free to go back and get more, uh, let's just, um, so far, what, what does the liturgy of the word say to you about living the liturgy? And what might uh, you need from the liturgy of the word to help you live a little bit better? If that makes sense. Anything you want to say is fine. There are no grades here. This is, this is great for me, too. <laughs> I'm thinking if I really tune into all you've been saying and really, you know, take it to heart, this could be a, a wonderful source of enrichment for, for my person and then for others that I meet. Anyone else? <coughs> I was on WhatsApp and I received a message from uh, Sister Betty in Peru and she wanted to share 15 simple acts of charity that we can use during the week. One, say hello when you walk into a room or say hello to anyone that you come across. Two, say thank you even if you don't think you need to. <laughs> Remember everyone always, and remember uh, to love everyone. Say hello with enthusiasm and happiness. Listen what other people have to say without any prejudices or uh, judgments. Listen with love. Do we have time to go on? Or do you want me to go ahead. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay. Um, always stop and help someone who needs help. Uh, be the person that can lift someone's spirits. Celebrate other, others', others qualities and um, successes. This is in Spanish, so I'm having to translate it in my mind right now. Um, choose what you don't use and get rid of it. Um, not get rid of it, uh, give it to someone who can use it. <coughs> Help even if it's not necessary so that someone else can rest. We all know that one person who wants to do it all. Um, oh, and if you must, if you must correct someone, do it with love, not uh, in an intimidating way. Um, and I think that's the last one. Yeah. And when we do that, we are living the liturgy. Thank you. For me, it's an infusion of the spirit so that I, I embody that and like take it out. And when you spoke about the homily, and um, sometimes I feel that and it, it refocuses kind of, oh, oh, that's what. But, but also sometimes when I can't, it's I trust that the spirit is in me, that I can live it out. Yes, we, trusting that spirit. We can't always, I think this is, this is what, um, when, when I was studying and learning all of this, I was thinking, 
I can't do it all, you know. But the spirit, just our presence there, gives us something to carry on and, and not get caught up in, in worrying about the fact, well, I shouldn't go back anymore because I'm not, you know. The spirit is working within us in, a ways, in ways that we don't even know, just by our presence there. Thank you. I like your second question a lot. What do we need from the liturgy of the word to, to live liturgy better? And I keep thinking about, uh, some of us in this room will know Father Pat Render. He was the pastor at St. Joe's here in town. And I, I was there at that time as well. And what I remember about his homilies was that he always connected it to something that was happening in our community of St. Joseph Parish that week. And that was huge because I think it did a couple things. It helped us to realize that there was a connection between the liturgy and our daily lives. And it helped us to bring those situations to consciousness and to prayer in a deeper way. And that in turn made us a community of prayers. And I, I miss that so much often in uh, the homilies that we get. There's not a sense that this is particular for the people who are sitting right in front of you. It's really, really important that it, that it is. Thank you, that is important and it's, it's the challenge that's before us because more and more we're gonna have sacramental priests and if we don't open up the preaching, um, it will have to be much more generic, which we'll, we'll get something out of it, but. That's true, I hadn't thought about that, but that's our reality, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Okay, <clears throat> so that's the first half of the Mass. Now we move into the celebration, or the, the liturgy of the Eucharist. Lots of things going on here. We have the gifts prepared, we have them presented, we have prayers over the gifts, we have what's called a preface, we have the Sanctus, the Eucharistic prayer, and the great Amen. <clears throat> and again, we, <clears throat> we've come from the, from the universal prayers that ended the liturgy of the Eucharist, Liturgy of the Word, and we are moving to the great Amen. After we get to the great Amen, we have our communion rite, which is high, and then we come down to the concluding rites. So that's our rhythm in this celebration of the Eucharist. When we prepare the gifts, we have a collection. Now, we often think that's the money, and yes it is, but remember what we're doing in liturgy. We're doing a lot of collecting, and so the basket is primarily, we'll be honest about it, primarily is our treasure. It is the money that we collect to, to be able to continue the the church facilities, etc. But we shouldn't think only in terms of what we see. Because what we see in liturgy always has a deeper meaning. So when we collect the, the money, when we're doing the collection, we are sending in that basket our time, our talent, and our treasure from the week before because we brought it with us into the liturgy. And now we're gonna send it to the table. We're gonna send it to the altar as an offering. Remember, uh, the, the Constitution on the church said, we uh, offer the divine victim, Christ, and we offer ourselves. So this is the preparing of the gifts is not limited to the preparing of the bread and wine. It is preparing the gifts that we are sending in that offertory, that whatever you want to call it, presentation, the procession with the gifts. We need to be sending our gifts in with the, um, in, or putting them in the basket as it goes by, not just our money. So, pre presenting the gifts. Just what I said, what we, what we see is bread and wine. And what is hidden 
nourishment for living life. So we see bread and wine. We see a basket of, of a collection basket. We need to see deeper. We need to see what's hidden in those visible created realities that are there. So this is where liturgy and creation are integrated, how they are interrelated. Our prayer, blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received two things. We have received the bread we offer. Where did it come from? It's fruit of the earth. It's work of human hands. It will become for us the bread of life. And then for the wine, it's the fruit of the vine and the work of human hands. And it will become for us our spiritual drink. I think we miss the work of human hands. Do we think about where this all really came from? It came from the earth, obviously. It came from the earth. These are created realities that we bring to the table. But we can't forget that there are people connected with that. There are the people who crushed the grapes and made the wine. There are people who baked the bread and, and gathered the wheat. That's, that's what we're doing. We're not just preparing and celebrating the bread and wine. We are celebrating, acknowledging, remembering everyone connected with it in order that we might have it. So the idea that um, we would forget that there are people, people who have given of their gifts and talents and work of their hands, they need to be part of this, they are part of this celebration that we have gathered. They're not external to it, they're part of it. And we acknowledge that as we prepare the gifts. And we prepare the gifts so that they can be transformed. Not because there's anything bad about the wine, or anything bad about the bread. We don't transform them from something that's not good to something that is good. We give them purpose. We're giving them purpose. The transformation is about, this is going to be nourishment for my spiritual life. Not my lunch, my spiritual life. This wine is going to give me the grace to pour out my own blood. So the transformation of the gifts and our transformation at liturgy is not about anything moving from good to bad or bad to good. It's about giving a purpose. So in this procession, when these gifts are brought up, we're basically saying take what we bring and do something with these gifts. Make our lives what your life was and is. Transform it. Transform us. Move us deeper. So here, uh, my, my whole point in this section is, the, and there's a lot of study going on right now about all of this. How do we connect liturgy to creation? Because it's so intimately connected. And we've not really, um, it, there are a lot of scholars, I should say, that are working on it. But I don't think we, you know, we're kind of slow at getting people catechized about things. That's my job at Marian Catechesis, uh, teaching people. But anyhow, how is liturgy and creation interconnected? I think that the preparation of the gifts gives us a, a, a big hint about that. And, and how, to, how do you move into that interrelatedness in the liturgy? I think part of it is just recognizing what's going on and seeing some of those connections because sacraments are always about created realities. Um, probably if you went to uh, Catholic school, you learned a sacrament is an outward sign. It's something concrete that you can see, but it's an outward sign of an interior 
something, grace, a something deeper. And, and in liturgy, that's what we do. We have a lot of things we can see. We have a lot of things that are, are intended to draw us deeper, not to stop at what we see, but to go deeper into its meaning. And that's, that's what's going on here with creation. Okay, after that we're going to move into um, more liturgical language. So, the Lord be with you, what does that mean? Shift, a shift is happening, we're going to shift. So we got the gifts prepared and we're going to shift. And we say, the Lord be with you and with your spirit. It's calling us, we're moving, okay, spirits, are we still together? Are we still connected here? Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Okay, folks, something's happening here. A sacramental encounter is coming. Where's your heart? Wake up. Lift up your hearts. Okay. We lifted them up to the Lord. Our hearts are here. Our hearts are in the right place. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God is right and just. We know we are here because it's right and just. This is where I need to be right now. And I'm here. My heart is here. My heart is lifted up. And it is right and just that we do that. So this gets us set, it brings us in, we're moving into the preface, the beginning of the Eucharistic prayer. So this prayer, okay, so this prayer is also telling us that all during 90%, you know, I guess I could be proven wrong in this statement, so I'll say 90% of the liturgy of the word is addressing the assembly. Now, we're shifting to addressing God. This prayer is going to address God. This is the prayer of the church. The presider directs attention to the Trinity, not to the assembly. Let us pray for, no, God, we come to you. We're talking directly to God. And from the preface to the end of the Eucharistic prayer then, God is addressed. So this is a, a big shift of what's going on. The assembly was talked to in the beginning of the liturgy in general, and now we're gonna to shift to address, to address our prayer to God. <laughs> holy, holy. Okay, let's connect the holy, holy to the glory to God. So it's about the angels. The Sanctus, the, the, Sanctus, the holy, holy, sings of the invisible realities into which we are caught up. This is, we are moving into the invisible reality of bread and wine, our own gifts. And we are getting caught up in that. And the singing of the Sanctus teaches us we are standing before the very throne of God with the angels and saints. Now our Gloria told us that too. And we joined to the angels and saints. And again, this heaven and earth, there's no geographic distance anymore. There's, there, there never is. But anyhow, in liturgy, there is no geographic distance between heaven and earth. What's going on is heaven and earth. Maybe hyphenated. But no geographic distance. And so we sing our holy, holy. We, re we go back. We've done this. We did this in the liturgy of the word. Now we're going to do it in the liturgy of the Eucharist to join our voices with the angels and saints. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Again, this is Christ is among us. There's no question about Christ among us. It isn't that Christ is coming. Christ is here. But wake up. Stay alert. Christ is here. But the purpose is that, is, that a sacramental encounter is coming that we need to be alert, to, to be aware of that sacramental encounter with Christ. So, in our holy, holy, pay attention, take note. 
If you've been drifting off, come back. And then we have the Eucharistic prayer. So that preface, it leads us into the Eucharistic prayer. We begin it with a dialogue. It's going to be addressed to God. We have our holy, holy, wake up, be alert. Christ is here, but a sacramental encounter in the, in the, the eating of the body and blood of Christ is about to happen. It isn't that Christ is going to appear. Christ is here, but we will have... We, we need to be open to a sacramental encounter with Christ. Active listening. Okay, so we move into the Eucharistic prayer in the same, with the same posture as the readings. And we listen. We listen to this prayer that's going to remind us of who God is, how God came, we're going to remember some of salvation history stories. We're going to pray for people past, present. We are praying for the future, glory. So we are actively listening within the assembly. And we do it to remember what Christ has and is accomplishing on our behalf. So we are listening, active listening, and again, Back to the liturgy of the word. When we hear the scriptures read, proclaimed, we take an active listening posture. So this Eucharistic prayer um, is that long prayer that we have. And, and the whole purpose of it is to remember the Paschal mystery, to remember the events of salvation, to remember Christ's life. Okay. Epiclesis or epiclesis? Either way works. I usually call it a, um, an epiclesis. But uh, this, epiclesis, is a very significant uh, part of the Eucharistic prayer. And it is when the presider puts both hands over the bread and wine and prays that the Holy Spirit will come down upon the gifts. So there's a gesture, and there are words that call to the Father to send the Holy Spirit upon these gifts. So it's a moment in the prayer that sometimes is acknowledged as consecratory. But, con uh, but contemporary liturgical theologians understand this entire Eucharistic prayer as consecratory. So this is not, this is, this whole prayer is, an, is, is done to consecrate, but it isn't just one moment in which consecration takes place. This is a moment within this whole Eucharistic prayer that we call the Holy Spirit down upon the gifts to make them the body and blood of Christ. But then, this is harder to hear in the liturgy. There's a second epiclesis, and the epiclesis is on us. We, the Holy Spirit, is called to be with us, to come down upon us. Sometimes I think we miss it, because, but because it's easy to miss. So we have four primary or four common Eucharistic prayers. There's a lot more, but those are the four original. In the first one it says, so that all of us who through this participation at the altar receive the most holy body and blood of your Son may be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing. That grace is understood as the Holy Spirit. It's a little more clear in Eucharistic prayer too that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's with us. Grant, in three, grant that we, who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son, be filled with his Holy Spirit, may become one body and spirit in Christ. And Eucharistic four, that gathered into one body by the Holy Spirit, that they may truly be living sacrifice in Christ to, to your praise and glory. Now think about it. We call the Holy Spirit down upon the gifts of bread and wine. 
and we call the Holy Spirit down upon those assembled. It's pretty powerful to think that we share in that calling down of the Holy Spirit upon our gifts. Eucharistic prayer has intercessions because we all, we all need to be interceding for one another. And again, this is like the universal prayer. It's the whole church. It's about the whole church. It's not, it's not all about me. It's about the universal church. The intercessions extend us beyond the assembly gathered. The assembly is visible, is the visible reality of what is hidden in all creation. We are the visible reality of our connectedness with one another and all life and all creation. What is visible takes us to something that is deeper and more uh, powerful. And so we have our intercessions. We also have intercessions for our, our church leaders. We remember them. We pray for the sick. We pray for the dead. And we don't just pray for the dead in our, our community. What, their name might be mentioned, but it's always end with all who have died. So again, it, uh, the intercessions in the Eucharistic prayer call us to, to an awareness of the entire world. Jesus models sacrifice for us. Jesus' body is handed over to death, and Jesus' is Jesus' blood is poured out. That's how we understand Eucharist, Eucharist as sacrifice. So we talk about the um, we talk about the altar of sacrifice, and we talk about the table of nourishment. And it's not either or; it's both and. When we say altar. We need to be hearing in our head, nourishment, table. When we say table, we should remember that there's sacrifice there, that it is a sacrifice. It's, a, it's an altar sacrifice, and it's a table of nourishment. And we can't dismiss the altar of sacrifice because it is Jesus who sacrificed for us. It's his body that was given over to death. So there is a sacramental, sacrificial element in the Eucharist. Jesus makes the ultimate sacrifice with his life to end all sacrifice, physical sacrifice, and to move it into sacrificial praise, sacrifice of praise. Okay, so this moves us then to the climax, to the great amen. The Eucharistic prayer ends with a Trinitarian doxology, which simply means pray, praise. Doxology means praises. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours, Almighty Father, forever and ever. Amen. Now, I said this prayer was consecratory from the beginning, from the preface to this point. Consecration is going on. And we are saying, Amen. We are saying, Yes to everything that went on. Yes, this is the body and blood of Christ. Yes, we have been consecrated. We have received the Holy Spirit upon us. It's yes to the all, has, all that has just taken place in this Eucharistic prayer. And as we stood for the Alleluia, we should be on our feet for the amen. I once heard somebody say, it stuck with me. It just makes so much sense. And I, when I'm conscious at Mass, I think about it. It's like being at a Neil Diamond concert and there's a standing ovation. That's what our amen is. It is about, yes, this is wonderful. What we have just done, what just happened in our midst is wonderful. And it, it's the affirmation 
of all that was remembered, all of Christ's life, all of our ancestors, and the encounter that we have and will continue to have as we continue through Mass. But it's that affirmation. So the amen and our doxology and our communion amen are connected because they proclaim our belief. So, amen uh, on your feet like you get up for the gospel and, and it is the affirmation of all that just took place. So, when you get to the amen and you think, oh my God, I was thinking about dinner, just remember, get on your feet and you know what you're saying amen to. You're saying amen that, that Christ is here. That bread and wine no longer is there. It's been consecrated in this prayer. And that we will share in that. So, we'll just take a, a minute um, because now we're, we're at the peak. We hit the peak and now we got to come down for the rest of the Mass. Um, but anyhow, describe what it would be like to live more intentionally the, the liturgy of the Eucharist, to live that blessed are you, Lord of all creation, to live in an awareness of human work with creation that we share and that makes our life good and that we are nourished by it. And how, how if you can get some ideas, how do you live that more intentionally? How do you, how do you um, bring that into your life? So take three or four minutes and just kind of talk about that to yourself, focusing on the idea of the liturgy of the Eucharist. Okay? Questions or talk about anything you want, really. <laughs> but but if, if you are so inclined. <laughs> um, I just had a question, and we were kind of discussing it and didn't really have a good answer. Mm -hmm. um, for the prayer over the gifts, is there a rule as to whether or not the priest says it allowed for the congregation to hear or just to himself? You're touching on something that I think is really important. Mm -hmm. it, if, if there is a hymn, it is prayed, it is prayed silently. Um, and that's why I think sometimes they choose even instrumental music or they stop. Well, in my parish, they, we sing a song until the gifts get to the table. And when we always hear it, mm -hmm. not always, occasionally we don't, but in general. But I think that's why, it, it, that's where I think this sense of the earthiness of our liturgy doesn't get heard. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't become part of us mm -hmm. because of that. But I think you're right. I, you know, I think, mm -hmm. uh, but the, the rubric says it's prayed out loud when there's no music, it's prayed silently when there is music. The way you presented it today, I'm realizing how transformative it can be. And I think um, I have to be much more intentional and more alert, wake up, be alert. So I don't, I don't think I'm grasping it fully. Well, I think, um, I think what our reality is if we can learn the I, what the purpose or what the meaning of the liturgy is, um, it, it will grow on us. If we believe it, it'll grow on us because, I don't know about you, but I, it, the, the amount of energy it would take to be in, um, uh, what do I want to say? So attentive that we catch everything that's going on in the liturgy. Um, I don't think we can. I mean, maybe those who are going to be canonized could, um, but I, I think that the human reality is that if you've ever had, what I think of is if you've ever heard the scriptures proclaimed and a sentence is in there, or even a word that really it's like standing out and shouting at you, that's when you end up paying attention. You know, it's kind of like, you may not pay attention to anything else at the Mass, because sometimes I have to run home and get the scriptures and say, I know, I've heard that story 
70 times and I have never heard that sentence and it's there. That's God speaking to us. And so if we understand what we're doing when we gather, I'm not saying don't pay attention. I'm just saying be, be real and intentional, but know that God will speak to you when you need to be spoken to. And, and I think you wanted to add to that? Yeah. Just really quickly, that's like Lectio Divina too. And you, sometimes I, I have a trouble. I have trouble getting my arms around understanding that because I think I'm trying to put too much into it. And you're right. When there's something that speaks to you and you hold it in your heart, then you live it out. And that's, I appreciate when you said to us, you know, that standing ovation that we may have been lost or gotten lost and all of a sudden we're like, oh, I'm back. Yes, that's a human quality that we can't beat ourselves up for because there's so much more and there's so much in it. So thank you for saying that. Okay, so now after saying what I just said about going to daily Eucharist, <laughs> the, the value of that is that it becomes oh, that kind of practice. And I, 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 there's a couple of analogies that come to me when I think about that. One is uh, someone who's a pianist or someone who's a, an athlete, how they have to practice and practice and practice so that it becomes like a body memory. So that's true of Eucharist as well, right? That we, mm -hmm. we immerse ourselves in it completely. The other thing is I always remember how when I would call home, mom, all mom had to do was say, hello. And in that one hello, I knew everything about how her day was going. I became so familiar to the, every little nuance in, in the two syllables, right? That, that's another thing that comes with regular practice of the Eucharist. You become attuned to those nuances. And, and you're right, you're not going to get it all every Mass, but you're going to get what you need to get at every liturgy. And I have found throughout my lifetime, I've lived pretty long, as you can see the gray hairs, but um, that different parts of the Mass will strike me at different times of my life. Mm -hmm. And so... You know, it may not be the same at every Eucharist, but, um, you know, that, that happens, or it can happen. I help with the music at a Mass, so every Sunday I'm on one of my grandchildren. For some reason I wasn't up there one Sunday, and he says, aren't you working today? <laughs> and I got thinking about it, I thought that's the attitude I have. I go to work because I get up there, and I'm like, okay, we got to do this song, and then let's see, are we doing harmony on this one? What's going on next? And I'm not fully with what's going on in the altar. So when we get the opportunity and go to a separate mass during the week, I thoroughly enjoy it. Because I just, I love going to mass. But I want to go to mass. I want to participate in the mass. Not that the music isn't part of it, but I don't want to be in charge of it. I want to just be part of it. Right, right. But, I, you know, there's something that comes after the Eucharistic prayer. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to flip through it pretty quickly, but I do just want to make a couple of points that I think are significant and connect us to what's going on and where we're going. So the communion rite comes after the, the great amen. And um, in this communion rite, we are in the presence of Christ, and we are moving into the future as Christ. And so, um, so we have three things that go on. We have the Lord's Prayer, we have preparation for communion, and, uh, and I want to see what, I want to just highlight a few things about the, the Lord's Prayer in context. Baptism. So we signed ourselves with the sign of the cross as we began to remind us of our baptism. We begin the Lord's Prayer with our Father. Now, language again, it's metaphor. And so we don't have the right language necessarily, but we have language that tells us about relationship, the intimacy of a relationship. And so all of us are connected together by our baptism and can say together, our Father. Now, another session we could go into why we say, 
I believe rather than we believe, but we'll save that for another time. Mm -hmm. Inadequacy of language. We simply don't know how to name God. Jews won't say Yahweh out loud because it's too sacred and it's reserved for in its sacredness and it's not verbalized. So we always have an inadequacy of our language, but in the Lord's Prayer we do heaven and earth are connected and we remember that that as we stand on earth we experience heaven because we don't reach up for heaven as this picture shows we reach in we go inside for our reality and the reign of God that's part of it but the reign of God is about God's will and it involves justice and peace for everyone. It involves fullness of life for everyone. That's what God wills. Fullness of life for everyone. Give us this day. It referred, this day is, again, like the eighth day. This day, hodie in Latin, is a day without, without not limited to 24 hours. Hodie. It's a day without a setting sun. It is resurrection. And we say that in the Lord's Prayer. And so we are called to live our daily bread hodie, this day, that doesn't have a beginning or end. It is always. But this is another thing. We're going up, we're preparing to go up to communion, and we say, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. I don't know about you, but sometimes I choke on those words. We, are, we began liturgy acknowledging our sinfulness and uh, in contrast to the mysteries and the glory of God. And now as we're approaching, we are asking God to forgive us as we forgive others. It's kind of scary, and I actually don't want that to happen. I'd rather God forgive me as God forgives. But this I did want to point out to you. I don't know if you saw it in the news, Pope Francis is challenging, um, lead us not into temptation. And he is saying that the correct uh, translation of the Lord's Prayer, as in Matthew 6, should be, abandon us not when in temptation. Isn't that beautiful? Um, and, and so this, this prayer is, is asking, can be asking God to be with us. We don't forgive real well. We have temptation. Be, please be with us as we approach the table. Yeah. <laughs> Deliver us from evil. Uh, this is a cry of hope for the promise of eternal life as we approach the table. And those are the things that are part of the, um, of the Lord's Prayer that I tried to highlight a little bit. But I also want to point this out because, again, this tells us about the universality of what we are doing and the globalness of what we are doing. As the priest begins the Mass with the Lord be with you or grace and peace of God or whatever the priest says, it is, it is an exchange that goes beyond the walls of the church. So when we engage in the sign of peace, it isn't a friendly hi. What's for dinner today? That greeting happens as we enter the church, but once we are in the church and the liturgy begins, we use our liturgical language, which is a greeting of peace. We, we are doing this after we pray the Our Father, after we have asked for forgiveness, after we have acknowledged our oneness as baptized people, we exchange peace because that says, I want to be reconciled that I want, as I approach this table for communion, I want to be at peace with the people here and the people in the diocese and in the Church of the United States and in the Church of the world. And the exchange of peace runs deeper than a friendly greeting. Don't tell college kids that or we'll have a revolt. But it nonetheless, we need to be thinking about that as we do it. So we process up to communion at the same way the gifts were brought up to the altar, except for maybe we're coming from different angles, but 
The idea is we process to receive back the gifts we presented, the gifts of who we are, our time, our time, talent, and treasure in the form of bread and wine. So when, when we are offered the bread, the body of Christ, this is the body of Christ. This host is the body of Christ. You make up the body of Christ. The church is identified as the body of Christ. So we live that Eucharist all week. And we come back to the Eucharist to be nourished and to be sent forth. So we, we come back to be gathered again, because we've been scattered, and now we are gathered, and then we're sent forth. So it's a cycle. That, that we, sell, that we um, engage in order to become and be the body of Christ. So I just end with our constitutions. The Eucharist is the font, it's the summit, it's the apex of Christian life, and if it's the apex of Christian life, it is also the apex of Dominican life. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Marianne.